This is WCPO 9 News. Thanks for joining us for WCPO 9 News. I'm Adrian Whitsett. And here's a look at some of today's top stories. The search for two missing Tri-State boys continues today. North Star International Search and Rescue says small teams will be out again in the Lawrenceburg area trying to find Nilo Lattimore and James Hutchinson. Despite sunny conditions yesterday, the group says the river was running too fast to have divers in the water. Cincinnati police officers have a big warning about crime in a local neighborhood. This electronic sign at the intersection of Calhoun Street and Moorline Avenue in Cuff asked people to lock doors and take keys. CPD says nearly 40 vehicles have been stolen in the neighborhood since the beginning of this year. Matthew 25 Ministries is putting together a truckload of supplies to help support tornado victims in the south. They're collecting personal care items, cleaning supplies, bottled water, tarps, trash bags, and more. If you have anything you'd like to donate, bring them to Matthew 25 Ministries off Kenwood Road in Blue Ash. A tri-state lawmaker is rolling up his sleeves today, helping locals get a COVID-19 dose. Ohio Congressman Brad Wenstrup, who represents Eastern Hamilton County, will help try health doctors and nurses this afternoon in giving vaccines to patients at the Wall Street Conference Center in Norwood. Wenstrup is a licensed doctor. Raven. All right, everybody, we are looking at a much cooler day. Also, mostly cloudy skies for the rest of the day. We won't start clearing up until we get to tonight. Now, as far as winds go, well, it'll be about 20 to 25 miles per hour, gust up to about 30 in some places. So it's going to be that kind of day. We'll drop down into the 30s for tonight. And then as we head towards the rest of your forecast, 50s for your Monday sunshine. And then looking at some midweek rain and for opening day, a little bit on the chillier side into the 40s. That's your forecast, everybody. Have a great Sunday. Rescue crews spent hours Saturday here at Grant Lake in Brown County trying to find two men. According to Brown County dispatchers, one man in a kayak tipped over in the lake and another man on shore jumped into the water to try and save him. Search and rescue crews were trying to find and save both of those men Saturday afternoon. The call came in around 4.15. Several departments were on scene, including the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the Bethel Tate Fire Department. Mount Oreb Fire and EMS led the search, and Loveland Water Search and Rescue actually pulled one of the men from Grant Lake. Rescue crews put that man into air care and flew him to UC Medical Center. Brown County Dispatch says the second man was pulled from the water, but he had died, and neither man was wearing a life jacket. The search wrapped up shortly before 8 p.m. From what first responders know right now, they say that man who went in and tried to help did not know the kayaker. He simply saw someone in trouble and jumped in to try and help out. First responders did not release the condition of the man who went to the hospital. We're still waiting to find out the identity of the man who died. Reporting at Grant Lake in Brown County, Josh Bazan, WCPO 9 News. Hey guys, WCPO 9 News reporter Jake Ryle here. Norwood police say Sunday's pursuit started here at Victory Parkway in Sherman. And for the first time, we're seeing the moments following a crash that led to several injuries. Hey firm, we're on Harrison westbound. You're inside of a Norwood police cruiser Sunday evening. The police pursuit has already changed jurisdictions. Now northbound on I-75 headed toward the Harrison Avenue exit. The Norwood officer ran the plate and the silver van they're now chasing came up as stolen. The vehicle ran the red light at Queen City. The suspect driving recklessly as the officer continues the pursuit. Left hand turn on uh, Grand Avenue. Oh, crash! That crash between a pickup truck and the stolen silver van. Two car NBA, two car NBA Westwood. Stop right there! The officer assesses the scene. Five people are injured. Some of the injuries considered serious. It comes in the wake of other police pursuits in the tri-state, one of which a CPD chase in the middle of rush hour, ending in Newport with 81 year old Raymond Label and his wife Gail dying at the scene after being struck by the fleeing vehicle last August. Following that crash, our I team examined police department police pursuit policies across the tri state. The issue there's no uniform pursuit policy across Cincinnati area departments, but that could soon change. The Hamilton County Police Chiefs Association is taking a look right now at coming up with a standard. The hope arresting the suspects without the need for a high speed pursuit, which could put civilian lives at risk. And if a pursuit is necessary for each department to follow the same protocols and procedures. Jake Ryle, WCPO 9 News.
NWCPO 9 News reporter Kristen Swilley, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir recently signed off on what's being called a redo bill. It allows students who struggled during the pandemic to make up their current academic year. But there are some people who are concerned about the domino effect this could create. I think the intent of the bill is wonderful. A good idea in theory, many believe, but is it the best play for students throughout the Commonwealth? Mother and teacher Kathy Fessler is optimistic, but unsure. I don't know about the implementation. I see a lot of kinks that have to be worked out. Among them, adapting course selection currently based on a four-year plan and budgetary concerns. What if everybody took you up on this and all of a sudden now you have another 20% more students? Uh, what is that going to do to the teachers in the terms of the number of kids in their classroom and the overall budget? Local school boards will have access to federal funds and the power to approve or reject any request to retake or supplement this year's classes. Governor Bashir says this is a chance to reclaim lost experiences and settle the score, especially for senior student athletes. And while educators have done their best in these trying circumstances, the pandemic has deprived some students of priceless opportunities and memories. It could be a win-win for a lot of kids, but I think there's a lot of logistics and, uh, and uh, just you know, things that have to be worked out to make it work for everybody. Kristen Swilly, WCPO, 9 News. More than 20% of people in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana have gotten at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccination. Meanwhile, as restrictions are relaxed and more folks are traveling, spring break may not be the cause of rising cases. Images of parties in Miami during a pandemic can seem alarming, but a Northern Kentucky University health expert says we can't overlook the true super spreaders. The first one is larger family gatherings that are taking place indoors. And the second are in places like restaurants and bars and places where you would go and you want to take off your mask so you can consume something, but perhaps the ventilation isn't good or you're not socially distanced or you're hanging out there for a few hours. CVG expects airport travel to increase by 50% over spring break and into the summer. Valerie Hardcastle says it's not so much the destination, but what you do when you get there. There's this impulse to just kind of throw caution to the wind, and maybe you've had one vaccine, but not both, uh, and just try to go back to normal living. And it's really dangerous to do that right now. You can safely go to the beach and just not be near crowds. States like Michigan are in the national spotlight for potentially hitting a fourth wave of COVID-19. Where do we stand in the tri-state? What we see right now in um, at least Kentucky and Ohio um, not so much in the other states that surround us, they, their growth rate is accelerating. But what you see right now is what's called community spread. And that means it's spreading at a rate that is kind of consistent over time. So we're not trending toward a fourth wave, but we're not trending away either. We're just kind of hanging in the middle. All the health officials I talked to say no matter if you're vaccinated or who around you may be vaccinated, masks are still essential. In the studio, Raven Richard, WCPO 9 News. As if we didn't have enough to worry about these days with politics and the pandemic, now people are receiving strange debit cards in the mail, and it could be either a scam or your stimulus check. Evelyn Schott opened her mailbox the other day to find an unexpected delivery to her Clifton home. Debit. Yeah, debit and visa. It was a U.S. Bank Relia card, the card that more than a dozen states use for unemployment benefits, including Ohio. Uh, at first, I thought it was my regular ATM card. And when I saw that it said Relia card, um, I got a little nervous. That's because Evelyn never filed for unemployment, so she called the number on the card. So they took my information. They also suggested that I file a police report. U.S. Bank says it's aware of this fraud, which can happen if a thief files for unemployment under your name and social security number. But U.S. Bank is just one debit card to watch for. Many states, like Kentucky, use Bank of America debit cards. Still others, like Indiana, use key bank cards. So be suspicious of any debit card showing up that you are not expecting. So what should you do if you get an unexpected debit card in the mail? The Federal Trade Commission says don't just cut it up or toss it, someone could be applying for benefits in your name. The FTC says report the unwanted card to the bank, contact the state unemployment office, and place a fraud alert on your credit with Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. But a caution, if you receive a debit card from MetaBank, 
with a note from the Treasury Department that's not a scam. That could be your $600 stimulus check, so don't throw it away. Evelyn says it's all very confusing. How did someone get your social? Usually from one of many recent data breaches. So don't throw away any unexpected debit card. Covering the rebound, John Mattery, WCPO, 9 News. This shot marked a major milestone in Kelly Neese's career. I'd say I'm proud of it, but it doesn't, I mean, winning's more important. Very few players have scored as many points as Kelly Neese, but he's still number two in his own family. That's video from 2016, a game winner from Kelly's older sister, Allie. On the same night, she reached 2,000 career points. Having your sister play and be the big star, I guess you could say, it was, it was really cool to look up to her and see what she, she could do here. Neither sibling, though, had an easy road to get there. Do you remember the night your sister got hurt? Oh, yeah. It was in a scrimmage in summer down here at the on the block down there. My left leg went backwards, popped out of place, and then popped back into place. We were sitting up there in the corner, and my mom yelled. And then I remember thinking in my mind, like, I didn't tear my ACL. There's no way I tore my ACL. Allie didn't just tear her ACL. She also tore her MCL and meniscus. You get a sickening feeling as uh, when you evaluate an injury like that, and you know what, uh, what it could mean for, uh, for that athlete. Allie had surgery and quickly began rehab. Rehab itself was super, I think it was more mentally hard than physically. Remarkably, she was able to make it back on the court by the end of her senior season. And now, she plays basketball at Northern Kentucky University. But unfortunately, that was not the last time Nick Repko would see a niece sibling walk into his office. Oh no. You know, my first thought was not not again. I'll, I'll never forget that at all. I mean, I could tell when I did it that something really bad happened. In the off season before his junior year, Kelly tore his ACL. Seeing her go through that recovery before really helped me, but seeing her go through that and then me go through that, she really like led the path for me to do that. Well, he's also kind of competitive, so he would be like, hey, if Allie can do it, I can do it. And he did. He recovered, which brings us back to this shot. Not even two years after the injury, <laughs> Kelly broke the all-time scoring record for Simon Kenton boys basketball. And later broke the single game record too, with 47 points in one game. Two siblings. It just taught me to not take anything for granted. And two devastating injuries. I want things to just stack up for him so finally he can be like, okay. All that was worth it because he's been through a lot. But through adversity, they gained perspective. In Northern Kentucky, Caleb No, WCPO 9 Sports. Ohio's arcade complex has been in limbo and in jeopardy for decades. In 2007, a group formed to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars to save it, and they took a newspaper reporter along with them. That newspaper reporter was me. I wanted to come back and see how the arcade has progressed. It's the most complicated project that I've ever worked on for sure. Wyoming resident Francis Kern Manone handled the financing. This is a more than $90 million project requiring dozens of tax credits, loans, grants, and more. I like to say that I did a lot of the transaction from the high speed lane of Inter in Interstate 75. Cross Street Partners is one of three key players bringing this national historic complex back to life. OTR based model group is another. If you were at UC in engineering, structural engineering, and wanted to do your thesis, this was the place. Long before he worked in Cincinnati, George Kepler was a UC student. Michael Rick just graduated. I did a lot of drawings, but this is really the first time I've been able to see my drawings kind of come to life. The iconic rotunda is starting to come to life again. It will be an event space connecting to a bar. 126 apartments there are almost done. <laughs> And the hub is a co-working space and business incubator backed by UD. There's a lot of cool pieces and it's really being able to take advantage of every cool element. Just how important is it? There are a lot of people in the community who weren't going to believe that the redevelopment of the downtown central business district was really happening until they saw the arcade starting to go to, to re-engage the way they wanted it to. In downtown Dayton. Go to Skyline here and they're talking about it. I'm Evan Miller, WCPO 9 News. We call this the most emotional building in Dayton, Ohio. It was the gem of the gem city, 
Built between 1902 and 1904, it was downtown's retail and restaurant hub. I compare that to the Finley Market in regards to it's the same thing as the farmer's market to start with, the same concepts. And look, everybody cherishes the Finley Market in Cincinnati. It's the same thing here. It was almost a no-brainer then for OTR-based model group to be part of bringing it back. We really want to help Dayton turn things around. Despite being on the National Register of Historic Places since 1975, the arcade was once listed on eBay, looked at to be torn down for scrap. It hasn't been used since the holidays of the early 90s. It's probably in the top two of the toughest projects I've done in 43 years. Decades of decay have taken their toll. It was a nightmare. Nelson Stark Company plumbing superintendent Boyd Williams grew up in Trenton. He got more than his name from his dad. I knew my father and my uh, father-in-law worked there back in the late 80s. Imagine his surprise finding an almost untouched office with their time cards sitting on a desk in the arcade basement. You can see the 8-1-89 date and my father-in-law is the top Hager back and second to the bottom with my father's name. I'm the third so there's Boyd Williams. Williams. There were plenty of surprises. Every time we took a wall down, every time we opened up something, it was a problem. Nine buildings, all different but connected. They managed to keep some terrazzo floors, some wood ones, and these details around the rotunda. Most of the space is now the hub, a business incubator with UD and Sinclair students. 126 apartments are about to open. A bar is going in on the first floor. It is a mixed use development. First floor vi vibrancy is key. It's not just the inside. They've had to restore several facades, too. They're still working on this one. The last time I was at the arcade was in 2007 as a newspaper reporter covering the effort to save it. This is what the North Arcade looks like today. It's in dire need of getting refurbished, Please but don't. we're ready to attack that. This will become a kitchen incubator and fresh food market. Think Findlay Kitchen and OTR plus retail and a hotel or more apartments. This is one of the keystones to get revitalization downtown. Because it is one of a kind. At the end of the day, you know, what's your value proposition? What makes Dayton different from Cincinnati, Cincinnati different from Northern Kentucky? A lot of it's that history. In downtown Dayton. And the history is like right behind us. I'm Evan Millward, WCPO 9 News. Hello everyone, I'm Nine First Morning Meteorologist Sherry Hughes. We got into the low 70s today and this evening we will have clear skies, but clouds will be building and overnight we'll start to see some showers and also storms develop. We could even pick up an isolated strong to severe storm as you can see a portion of the tri-state from Cincy southward and portions of southeast Indiana are under a marginal risk of maybe one of those storms or two becoming a little stronger with some gusty wind and also hail. Rain though likely won't move in until I'd say 1 or 2 a.m. It will be very quick moving across the tri-state, so by 8 or 9, getting up in the morning, it'll all be done. We'll be left, though, with some gusty winds out of the west, gusting upwards to about maybe 30 miles an hour. Cloudy conditions, but cl skies will begin to clear as we head into the evening. So here's a look at your forecast. We're going to be, again, in the mid-50s at 8 in the morning with maybe a few showers still around. Temperatures still sliding down, 52 at noon, 50 at 4 p.m., and we're at 46 by 8 p.m., but we're dry. I'm Josh Bazan. An Ohio woman is reuniting with a pet that has been missing for years and only recently turned up halfway across the country. We'll share her excitement and how the two were able to be brought back together. And one day he just didn't come back, didn't come back, didn't come back. More than five years ago, Margaret Bertram lost her pet cat, Bernie. She says he was outside in her yard in Florence, but that's the last time she ever saw him. And I looked and I called the shelters and finally um, just kind of accepted that he was never coming back. Bertram moved to the Dayton area around the time Bernie went missing. All this time, she went without any news or any hope until last month. Apparently, someone found Bernie in central Texas um, and they traced him back to me. A volunteer with that organization in Texas happened to be driving through Cincinnati on a family vacation. So she put Bernie in the back seat and made sure he got home safely. Oh, please let this be them. <laughs> them. Oh my God. Let's put this down. <laughs> Here is my sister. Here is my sister. Oh, 
<laughs> oh my gosh. A reunion five years in the making, but a reunion Bertram never expected to get. I can't believe it. Uh, yes. Look at him. Hi, buddy. You're like, what's going on? There are still plenty of unanswered questions. How did you end up in Texas? That's what I want to know. We need to talk. But Bertram is thankful to have Bernie back in her arms. I didn't think I was ever going to see you again. And now here we are. I'm so glad. How often does something like this happen? Just amazing. And he, all the way in Texas. Someone found Bernie in Waco, Texas. He was clean and healthy, so volunteers assumed he had a local family. But the people who run the Heart of Texas Lost and Found Pets page found out he had a microchip and tracked it back to Bertram. But to be able to come visit my family and bring somebody along and give them the joy of having their animal back, it just makes the trip that much worth it. Nobody is exactly sure how Bernie ended up so far from home. But Bertram says that mystery is okay with her now that he's back where he belongs. In Winton Place, Josh Bazan, WCPO 9 News.